This is Keyed In with Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. And now, here are your hosts, Max Rabin and Brent Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Keyed In podcast. I'm your host, Max Rabin. And I'm Brent Jackson. So I wasn't here last week. Did you miss me? No, we had a blast. We had a party. There was he uh, didn't miss dancers. We Damn had it. musicians here. It was crazy. <laughs> well, uh, it felt like uh, an eternity between like the last episode and now. And then you did a recording. And I, so if I'm a little rusty today, I'm sorry. We'll figure it out. Nah, you were greatly missed. We enjoyed your uh, your enthusiasm. You're in the A seat, you know, leading the ship to the beginning through the end. So I had to fill in for your shoes and Leslie stepped in yeah uh in my shoes so we did an all right job well i can't wait to hear the episode i heard it went well and so um sorry i missed it but you know like taking kids to summer camp and everything got shifted because some of the counselors had covid and you know that set, set my week way off so we have camp now we have our little guy in sailing camp down at the navy yard and it's from nine o'clock until two and yesterday it was storming so we had to pick him up at like 12 o'clock my wife was like all right she's like can't they do something like take him back to the boathouse and play Scrabble or something. Really? So. Like, we can't always be sailing with her. No. Right? Um, well, let's talk to our guest. He's right here. This is Will Fastow. Will Fastow is with TTR Sotheby's International Realty. Um, he is very well known, uh, especially for specializing in uh, one of our upper Northwest markets, Spring Valley, but he does business all over the place. And he also has a long history with real estate. You, your family's in real estate too, right? Uh, yeah, my family's owned a uh, number of multifamily properties, mainly historic row houses around D.C. and Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather was actually an appraiser. So that's kind of my, my first foray into it. And uh, I just wanted to say, because I want to make sure I got it out of the way. Yeah. Uh, guys, this podcast is awesome. Like we're in a really protectionist industry and you guys have found a way through this medium um, to get people to come on here and sort of open up. And uh, that's that's a lot. So Thank congratulations. You. Yeah, we're always surprised. They just keep talking and talking. We're like, go, <laughs> go on. Keep, keep at it, right? We like the secret sauce because then we can take what you tell us, the little bit of nuggets and implement into our business. Well, so, I think it's great. I mean, we're, uh, real estate can be, as I said, so protectionist. And I think we all try and be in abundance mindset. And it's great hearing all these other agents come on, people that we know, that we've worked with, that we might not like know as well as we'd like to and kind of yeah. hear how they're running their business. I mean, it's... Uh, it's really been great for me. So thank you for having me and hopefully I can do justice to it. Well, thanks for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been looking forward to speaking with you um, a lot as well. Um, so let's, we always like to talk, do our origin stories, talking about how people got into real estate. So we were just brushing on that, that your family was doing some real estate stuff. So tell us how you specifically got into this part of residential real estate. So, um, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., uh, went to college at James Madison out in Harrisonburg, uh, got a lit degree and you got know, a, what degree? a literature degree Lit Okay. and realized that um, I didn't really have a skill set. Like, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do for work. So I uh, applied to a bunch of different grad schools and uh, I got into a graduate school for marketing up in Boston. So went up there, was looking for a rental to live in while I was going to uh, graduate school. And the rents in Boston were insane. I mean, like, probably no different than they are here now. But sure. at the time, coming from Harrisonburg, it was like spending fourteen or fifteen hundred dollars a month for like a crappy studio apartment with a hot plate seemed crazy. <laughs> Side note: I dro I drove through Harrisonburg to take the kids to camp last week, and we were like, "Oh, this is where uh, James Madison is." Oh, yeah. You know? So there you go. Okay. So uh, this was right around like two thousand one. Um, market was hot, but it hadn't really like popped yet. And um, it turned out that you could buy like a multifamily building in Boston for, you know, significantly less than what your rent would be if you rented out the majority of the building. So I found a little building in the south end of Boston that uh, my family helped me out with. This was back in the days of Countrywide where you could just say, oh, yeah, I make a lot of money. Give me a loan. And they would do it. So how did you find this building? Were you using an agent or just Craigslist? We were walking through the neighborhood um, and there was a little boutique real estate office on the corner in this neighborhood. It was a super cute neighborhood. And I just walked in and asked them what rentals they had. And in their door, they had all the hot sheets, you know, the, the little yep. pictures that they would put in the doors explaining different properties they had. And they had this multifamily building that had been sitting on the market for a while. 
and it was a block away. So we walked down to it, looked at it, and it was great. So we made an offer on it. And uh, to put things in perspective, this was a 2,500 square foot, three unit building, a five minute walk from Boston Common, and uh, we bought it for $800,000. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my Boston experience, I went to college in Boston also, and you know did the college rental thing where it's like, Yes, you go to these small, weird offices in random spots, and they all have the same list of rentals. And you, some young guy shows you a bunch of units, and you pick one and pay way too much for it, right? Oh, it's crazy. But there were condos in, uh, in I, I lived in the Fens area. The condos were fairly cheap at that time. Yeah. This is like a late 90s. Okay, so like you could buy a condo there for like a couple hundred thousand. And then we all know what happened to like all of our urban markets, you know, since then into the early 2000s and beyond. So, I mean, that's like easy great move and south end probably hadn't popped yet right no the south i mean the south end was really <clears throat> rough around the edges still it was it had all the signs of a neighborhood that was going to be gentrifying but it was still um a lot of affordable housing uh a lot of vacant houses a lot of undeveloped lots so it was still you know if you were out at one or two in the morning walking the streets like you were definitely looking over your shoulder still mm -hmm. um so bought the building went through graduate school got a degree in marketing, um, had a number of job offers from different uh, marketing firms. Uh, and my focus was television ad buys, mainly cable news ad buys was what I had sort of positioned myself as. Um, and then September 11th happened. And that so totally changed the television cable marketing landscape overnight. Mm -hmm. um, CNN went commercial free for like six months most of the other cable networks carried either CNN or Fox News for like two or three months. And we were just in this constant 24 seven news cycle. And I didn't have a job. I wasn't in school. So I walked out my building one day, walked down to the little boutique real estate office on the corner that sold me the building. And I asked them if I got my license, would they give me a job? And they said, sure. So back then it was 24 hours of classroom instruction. So you did 12 hours on a Saturday, 12 hours on a Sunday. You sat for your exam on Monday and Tuesday you started your real estate career. Wow. So that's how I started. That's yeah. quick. Yeah. And I was, I think, 22, 23. Okay. So like a baby. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the same age when I started, so like just like total looked like a baby too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People really don't they, don't, they don't have the same kind of trust. It takes a while. So that, that's how I started. And I started working in Boston and uh, picking up clients. I mean, this was kind of like pre-smartphones, pre like not pre-internet, but like internet leads wasn't like a big thing. Like this is Zillow wasn't a big thing. So you had your hot sheets in the window and you had your door open. And this was a small boutique office in the center of a small boutique neighborhood. And people would walk in seeing something in the window and you'd you know, start up a conversation with them and then take them out and show them a couple of things. And we see, were, were you doing like rental stuff? Like for the, I did a lot of rentals. Yeah. I remember my, my first deal, um, I was thinking about it cause I thought you guys might ask, um, was a car rental. It was a parking space rental. Okay. Oh, wow. Somebody <laughs> lived in the neighborhood. They wanted to rent a parking space behind one of these row houses. So we took them out, we showed them a bunch of different parking spaces and then they finally rented one for, I think it was like, 250 a month and i think i spent three days with them and i made 125 dollars after the split with my broker and then they ended up backing out of the lease because they couldn't get their car into the parking space so i actually had to like turn the check back over oh wow come yeah. on that was it that's classic did you i'm just curious did you keep up with these people like down the road like they end up buying like a million dollar property somewhere you know it's um all of the things that I do now for my business, the staying in touch with client, uh, with clients, staying in flow, building out a CRM, like all of that stuff, I didn't know how to do any of that when I was like 22, 23. I mean, it was just right. people would come in, I would rent them something, I would sell something, I'd get my check, I'd immediately spend half of it, pay my rent, and then like looking for the next deal. I mean, it was literally, you know, it was the salad days, as they would say. So you know? wait. Just at at what level, like of towniness, were the other guys that and that been people that worked in that real estate office, like the bought like Boston towny kind of people? Because I remember going into some of those offices when I was looking for rentals, and these guys were like young Boston guys with the accents, and I mean, you you, you were from like D.C. Yeah. What was the crew like? I mean, so the South End was a quick gentrifying. Um, 
predominantly gay neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So the guy who owned the brokerage was an old guy named Al Rondo, who had to have been, I think, in his like mid 70s by the time I was there. His boyfriend, Brian, who um, were from Newburyport, which is about 30, 40 minutes north of Boston, kind of a, a Tony, like a waterside neighborhood on the North Shore. And they would drive in uh, to the uh, city every day and open up this office. And then the two other guys was an older gay man named David Richardson, who had Parkinson's, who lived in the neighborhood. And then uh, a woman named um, uh, Barbara Rosenfeld, who was also you know, a single woman in her probably 60s, who'd been working in the neighborhood for years. And she was probably the okay. most like Boston yeah. heavy accent. And she actually sort of became my initial mentor for the first couple of years. So it was like, it, was, it sounds like an experienced crew. That's probably one of the reasons you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was, I was the, everybody was easily twice, if not three times my there age at that point okay. in time. Different from the experience of some of the places I, like, I'm thinking like these places around like Mass and Boylston is very little different. So yeah, to to yeah, totally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it probably works to your benefit, too. I'm totally. just thinking like on our team, some of those agents probably don't want to deal with like the rentals. Doesn't matter what price point, they're going to yeah. punt them down to you. And some of like the smaller price points, they might punt down to you as well. Yeah, I mean, it was very much a um, you would sit desk time, people would come in, and whoever you captured, that was your client. And, you know, people gravitate towards agents that they feel are representative of themselves. So as the neighborhood was turning over and younger and younger people were coming in, they were more probably attracted to me as an agent than necessarily sort of the older established crew. But at the same time, I just didn't have the neighborhood connections and sort of the neighborhood chops that everyone else in the office did. So um, I benefited from that experience and those connections. But um, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a crash course. Mm -hmm. So um, after these first years in Boston, so when, so I see that you started your own group. Was that back in D.C.? So uh, I was at the small boutique office mm -hmm. for three or four years. And then I moved my shingle to a Remax office, uh, feeling that I just, I needed a little bit more sophisticated of a brokerage. I wanted to get out of the boutique model. Um, I was there for a couple of years. And around 2007, 2008, I knew I was going to be moving with my then fiance back to Washington, D.C. How did you know? Um, there was more opportunity. She was in communications. Mm -hmm. um, my family was, my parents owned a healthcare business that they were retiring from that they wanted me to come back to Washington to run. So um, there were a lot of changing things. The real estate market was changing uh, right around going into 07, 08. So it just seemed to make more sense to move back to D.C. Um, the other thing that I realized was um, Boston's a very provincial city. So I was running into sort of this, uh, I refer to it as the chowder ceiling, is sort of this experience where I couldn't grow my business any further because I kept running in and losing to agents that I thought that I was more competent than who were local to Boston. Right. And, you know, Boston people wanted to work with other Boston people and I just couldn't quite break through. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to take my skill set back to Washington. I'm going to go home and uh, do that. So um, I set up a nice foundation. I'm thinking that you're in, a, you're in an area that you don't know anybody. So it forces you to hone in on some of the skill sets that are going to take you into Washington, D.C. and like better your career and set you up in a nice situation. Yeah. So knowing that I was going to be leaving Boston and, you know, we all kind of have our book of business that we're looking at over the next like six months to a year. I knew what my book was and I didn't feel that I should split that with my broker. So I formed my own brokerage so I could be independent to run out my book before leaving town. So okay. that's what I did. That's and that's how, and that's how I created the Appleton properties group. You knew that was in Boston. That was in Boston. Got it. In okay. fact, the reason is the building that I was telling you guys about mm -hmm. uh, was on Appleton street between Berkeley and Clarendon. So that's, that's where the name of the, the group came from. Okay. Just curious. So 800,000 in 2001, what is it worth today? Uh, we sold that building about a year and a half ago because the maintenance costs got uh, the the maintenance for the building became too difficult for us to manage remotely during COVID. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get to Boston because of the travel restrictions and 
my uh, superintendent and my all my handymen were retiring. So we sold that building kind of in a fire sale for a million seven fifty, and fully renovated. If somebody was willing to put a million dollars into that building to convert it back to a single family, mm-hmm. that's that building on that block is selling for just around four million. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's, it's really come along. It's significant. Yeah. So the Appleton Group. Uh, did you sell that to someone up in Boston, or do you still have the group up in Boston? Uh, no. Um, the building we sold to another uh, uh, investor who does multifamilies in Boston, uh, the Appleton Properties Group, I just sort of moved down here, used the brokerage name for uh, a couple of years, and then was doing friends and family um, transactions while I was running this healthcare company. And when the healthcare company folded, um, I walked into the Chevy Chase office of TTR Sotheby's, I sat down with David DeSantis, who's one of the partners there, and asked him if I could hang my shingle there. And I did that because I had just had a transaction with another agent in TTR, uh, Catherine Buckley, Mm -hmm. who I was very impressed by. And we had a great interaction and the brand seemed to be a good fit for me. So uh, she recommended it, a couple other people recommended it. So I thought I'd give it a shot. Uh, We're speaking with Will Fastow at TTR Sotheby's International Realty. Um, So when you're back in DC, did you, because we know, I mean, I think of you as like, you do a lot of business in the Spring Valley neighborhood of DC. Um, again, you work all over the place. I'm not trying to like put you in a box or anything, but did, did you move back to Spring Valley when you were coming back to DC originally? We moved back to the Palisades okay. initially. We lived on MacArthur Boulevard in one of those row houses uh, up on the retaining wall between Dana and Arizona totally. for um, about four years. And then when my wife got pregnant, we needed a bigger space. So we found this house in Spring Valley that was a 1940s uh, classic WCA and Miller built colonial house. Hadn't been, nothing had been done to it in years. We were only the third owners since 1945. So we bought the house and then proceeded to do a renovation. And um, I think it's the influence of my time in Boston about how hyper local the boutique brokerage was in the South End that once I was established in the neighborhood and once I'd renovated this house and got was getting back into real estate, I really invested in that specific neighborhood because that's how I knew to grow a real estate business was you know to be hyper local, to be in your community, to be talking to your neighbors, uh, to sort of be walk, walking the streets at night with your dog and just having that sort of pedestrian interaction with people because that's what I knew. And I just happened to be living in Spring Valley and it came together. So I don't think that it was that I necessarily targeted that neighborhood other than the fact that I was living there. But I also happened to be there at a time where Spring Valley was going through and still is going through a big demographic transition. And I've definitely benefited from that. And it's mm-hmm. become sort of the, the backbone of my business um, and something that we're really proud of in an area that I'm really happy to be, um, you know, a successful agent in. When did you move into Spring Valley? Right around 2014. 14. Okay, so you've been there for a little over seven years. Because I'm thinking now, like, I've been in the business since 2005, and I've seen Spring Valley, like, other agents kind of dominate that space. And now, thinking back, like, three to four years, that's kind of like your sandbox. Like, you're the go-to person. If, if we have a rental question, if we have something looking off-market, like, you're the go-to person. Yeah. Um, so it took about seven years. Can you tell us some of, like, the the secrets that you're doing up there, like the marketing initiatives, things like that, to kind of really dive in deep to get some of these clients? Sure. I mean, I think we, we, we prospect the agent, uh, sorry, we prospect the neighborhood the way a lot of agents do, which is we do the direct mailings. Um, we're involved in the community. We do community sponsorships. Um, we do a lot of events. So uh, we started a partnership with the Wesleyan Seminary, uh, sorry, Wesley Seminary, which is this large theological institution that's on Massachusetts. And they give us the use of their grounds and we do a lot of community events. So we do an outdoor movie night. Uh, We're now doing a uh, monthly uh, free yoga class on the Saturday mornings, which we're doing once a month, you know, from March to October. Um, And uh, we're just really involved in that community. So like on those two fronts, the movie and the yoga, 
are you outsourcing, I guess, the other vendors to bring in the movie screen, the sound, and then the yoga? Is there a gym that you're working with to get the yoga instructor over there? Yeah, so we bring that all in. We outsource to a yoga instructor. Uh, we set up the space. We make sure that the grounds are kept, the lawns cut, that the mosquito treatments in right. the summer here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we bring the movie screen in. We bring in food trucks. Like, we, we basically do it soup to nuts. Yeah. It's a good operation. Yeah. So, but it's it's... It's about bringing, our mantra is sort of to always be bringing value. It's sort of bringing value to the neighborhood. Like sure. it's not enough that we live in the neighborhood, that we uh, work in the neighborhood. We want to actively be contributing to that community and making it better. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, like we're not the person who sold somebody their house, but when the transition comes um, and they decide we need to upgrade, we need to downgrade, we need to move somewhere else, um, we get the call and they usually interview the agent who sold them the house and then they want us in the room because we're in that community and they want our opinion and our take. And we win a certain percentage of those, uh, those listing appointments. Just curious on the, going back to the movie night for agents that are just getting started in the business, is there a, can you quantify like it costs you $2,000 or $5,000 per movie event? I would say it probably costs us between about four to $6,000. To, to put together that event mm -hmm. okay. um, and it just depends um, though the it, the event is we're doing the event again this year this will be the second year we've done it and I would say that the costs are across the board 20 percent 25 percent higher than they were a year ago just because of labor inflationary pressures all that sort of stuff yeah um, but uh, it just depends how big you want to make it you know how many people show up so last year was the first year we did it. We got about 250 people. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. So we had, a really, we had a really good turnout. What movie did you play? We played Moana. Oh. So we do, we do kids. So kids movies with music are, of are clutch. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's an outdoor movie night. So, like, the kids are running around. They're playing. The older kids are singing. Like, it, it's a really festive environment. Yeah. And it's got to be something that you can sort of, like, that people know that they can sort of check in and check out of. I think you're doing better than most movie openings in, like, at real theaters at least theater theater. at least during COVID. yeah fair enough we fair were enough. We, we were probably one of the best upper northwest movie openings during COVID. better than buzz lightyear you're having a, a time right now you know um, i saw i saw that movie with my kids it was a great movie yeah i saw i, I liked it i think i fell asleep you fell asleep <laughs> it was just a, it's like every space movie <laughs> every space movie cliche jammed into one cartoon movie and i, I took our eight-year-old and she thought it was fantastic i'm like that was every space movie I've ever seen since 1977. All right. So, and they just threw it all in there and she's, he has no idea. So, but for me, it was too cliched. Sorry. All right. So no, but no buzz light year for Max. Yeah. I mean, zero stars. Okay. okay. That's pretty aggressive. <laughs> so going back and I'm really interested into this whole, uh, diving deep into your neighborhood because we do that in some of our neighborhoods like Capitol Hill, Navy Yard, but like for the movie night in the yoga, like where do you reach? Uh, the clients like how are you advertising these two events so um spring valley has a local publication uh, a, you know a print ad rag that they distribute for free to the neighborhood we have a full page ad in that and we do a lot of direct mailing to people listserv stuff and social media um the thing with direct mailing is you know we all send our little like just sold just listed flyers uh the reason we started doing the events is we wanted to be able to send a mailer to people's homes that was more than just what we were selling, what we were listing in the neighborhood. We wanted to represent something we were doing, something that added value, um, something that was different than what other agents were doing. So that sort of led us to, you know, do we want to send market reports? Do we want to send statistics? Do we want to send demographic information? And then we were like, well, if we created our own events and we did two or three events a year, that's two or three mailers. So we do a mailer once a month. Uh, that's two or three months where we're promoting our own events. And that's something that is interesting, pertinent, and um, really adds to the sense of community. And that's how we sort of went down that rabbit hole of doing the events. So uh, I actually think we kind of backed into it where the need to create direct mail content mm -hmm. is what led us to start doing the events and then the events were so successful and the response was so great that the events took on a life of their own and then we just kept piling on more and more offerings so we did the movie night and then we did the uh the yoga program 
And now we have like our neighborhood association does like a Halloween block party. So we sponsor that. And as a part of our sponsorship, we offer to do a free um, uh, to the association. We do a, um, a mailer to the entire neighborhood with a save the date for that. So it's really about driving our direct mail campaign which is targeted to sort of Spring Valley, Kent, Wesley Heights. And um, that's really become a big execution for us and sort of our first, our first point of contact with people in the community. And then we follow that up with the events and then hopefully they start following our social media. And then before you know it, we're having three or four or five touches a year with people who live in these neighborhoods. And that's how we've built out our business in that part of DC. It's probably one of the more I ideal locations in DC to to take advantage of, of these kinds of things too, because of the, like, there's lots of families there. You're not dealing with too of an oversaturated market in terms of competition or, and things have kind of, they're changing, you know, there's, there, there's definitely like some legacy agents in the city who are now like moving along. Um, so like great stuff. and. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and as I said earlier, like um, we really benefited from being in Spring Valley at a pivotal time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of demographic change in the neighborhood. The Spring Valley is one of the oldest neighborhoods by demographic in the city. So you have a lot of people who are living in these large houses who've been living in them for 20, 30 plus years, and they're now transitioning out. We have a lot of young families that are coming in. Um, a lot of those houses need to be renovated, which plays right to my experience having renovated my own WCA and Miller house that we purchased back in 2014. Can you explain to the audience and myself what WCA and Miller house is? So uh, Spring Valley was originally a deeply wooded area that um, the WCA and Miller company, which was a real estate development company, purchased from American University. And then they proceeded to create a mapped out subdivision development, which became Spring Valley. And it took them about 30 years to fill out the whole area. And there's actually two areas of Spring Valley. There's Spring Valley and Spring Valley West. Spring Valley West was actually developed more around the mid to late 80s, um, which is a bit denser part of the neighborhood closer to Massachusetts. So WCA and Miller was a developer who developed all of these houses. And they, um, they had a very specific aesthetic that they were going for. Uh, they were all about creating these sort of long rolling avenues, um, the smaller part of the neighborhood where the lots were smaller, they did a bit of a grid section, and uh, they built mainly colonial houses, center hall, side hall colonials, a couple of tutors, and they would have six or seven different models that they would have different architectural features, and they would sort of like sprinkle them around the neighborhood so that every house felt unique. And it sort of created that Spring Valley aesthetic that I think a lot of people are really drawn to now. Um, that Center Hall colonial sort of a state house feel on a good sized lot with good setbacks from your neighbors, but still having sidewalks, pedestrian friendly. And um, the other benefit to Spring Valley since I've been there is there has been an influx of commercial and though there's been some neighborhood resistance to it from sort of the older set, the younger families love coming into a neighborhood that has that residential separation, has good lot size, but you can still walk to Starbucks in your morning and get your coffee, or you can you know, walk to the CVS or walk to the butcher and get a steak for dinner that night. And that's really what's sort of driven the expansion in that neighborhood in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. is there are very few truly suburban residential neighborhoods in DC that have that walkability. Yeah. Yeah, Spring Valley's definitely, um, it's, it's obviously come a long way over the last 20 years, but it, in, since, especially since the pandemic with the rest of the market and what people are looking for uh, in terms of everything you're saying, like having a more lot space, having like more of a house, having something that looks traditional, the classic DC thing, which is what everyone always likes. Spring Valley, you know, they, it has all that. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny neighborhood though, because I mean, as you guys know, uh, probably a lot of your listeners don't, it's a neighborhood of paradoxes too. Um, it's one of the most conservative neighborhoods in DC. It consistently has the highest median price of any neighborhood in DC. Uh, it has a history of racial segregation. The entire neighborhood is built on a chemical weapons right. site. To, to note for any non-DC <laughs> listeners or inexperienced listeners, that is the one thing in Spring Valley, when you have buyers looking in Spring Valley, people know about 
was it after World War One or during World War One? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, American University was the home of the U.S. Army's chemical weapons program for World War One, and Spring Valley at that time was just a bunch of wooded hills, and they had a big cannon at AU University, and what they would do is they would have two infantry guys go out into the woods, tie a goat or a sheep to a tree, and then they would lob a mustard gas shell into the woods, and you know time how long it would take for the animal to succumb. And it was, it was more sophisticated than that, but that's how I explain yeah, it. Well, so, you know, you have, you have to interject a little humor into these things <laughs> when you're trying to explain to somebody I, I, that I, your, your house is built on a formally used defense site. Do you ever lose? I'm just curious because I don't sell that much in Spring Valley. But do you ever lose buyers to say, I'm not going to Spring Valley because of that? Absolutely. Totally. There, there, are, there are buyers who will not uh, buy in that neighborhood. There are agents who will tell you privately that they would not buy themselves in that neighborhood. Um, I think that the remediation efforts that the Army Corps has done over the last 30 some yeah. odd years have been very extensive. Um, and I personally, raising my family there, don't feel that it's an issue any longer. I mean, the truth is, is the number of carcinogens that we all come in contact with is so much higher now than it was 40 years ago, that whatever sort of trace remnants of this program sure. from almost a hundred over a hundred years ago yeah are, are probably you know the, the least of your concerns Fair um enough. but you know it, it is if you go down that rabbit hole that sort of that web md like you know why am i not feeling great oh it's because you know i have tuberculosis right. like it's the same it's the same thing like you look up spring valley and chemical weapons like you can go down a rabbit hole that will literally make you feel like if you walk into the neighborhood you're, you're taking years off your life and that's just not the case I'm, I'm more on the side of what you were saying like we are exposing ourselves to most of the time we don't even know mm -hmm. and then it's like years later you find out like oh yeah that cell phone that you had in your pocket it's going to give you uh, right. ball cancer or something sorry i don't so, know did that's you paint chips when you were a family a friendly show <laughs> but i'm you know what i'm saying so i mean a lot of the houses both in spring valley wesley heights and kent have asbestos roof shingles like if your neighbor's gutter is clogged and with all the rain we have in Washington, D.C., that rain washing across that asbestos shingle year after year after year, overflowing that gutter and then just going right into the groundwater and you have an in-ground vegetable garden next door, like that's hurting you more <laughs> than a 100-year-old chemical weapons program. Right. It's like buried way underground somewhere. So it is a little tough to say chemical weapons program and, and, and real estate in the same in the same sense. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah. But it's I mean, it's kind of as I said, it's what makes the neighborhood interesting. It's those paradoxes like I love being um, an agent who is Jewish, who sells in a neighborhood where the deeds still have covenants on them that restrict restrict the sale of the property to Jewish people. Like, I mean, it's just it's it's a little bit of D.C. history and. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be a little bit gruesome sometimes, but... Um, so how does that work? Can you walk us through that scenario? So you're transferring a deed, but it says it cannot be sold to a Jewish person. Like, what's the workaround? I'm assuming it's... it's I mean, the, the, there is no workaround. It's not enforceable under the Civil Rights Act. Right. Yeah. So um, the issue is, is that in order to get it removed, you have to re-record the deed with amendments, which I believe you have to go back to WCA and Miller and have them re-record the deed since they were the initial issuer of the deed. Which, oddly enough, if I, if I recall, I haven't actually done it. I've only heard other people who've attempted to do it. You actually have to pay WCA and Miller a fee to remove the restrictive language from the deed that is uh, not enforceable. Right. So it's sort of an injury to insult. Yeah, I don't think anyone's really going to go more probably not too many people go through that kind of trouble. It's just one of those things that if you if you look through deeds going way back in this city, some of the deeds go back 200 years, you're going to find all kinds of weird stuff. Yes. Yeah. So. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, and it was a big selling point when the developer developed the neighborhood, like in their advertisement about, you know, superior build qualities, lovely colonial houses, uh, uh, ample lots. And it specifically says in there, restrictive covenants that ensure the continuity and value of the neighborhood. Like they were advertising the neighborhood as certain people can't live here, mm -hmm. so that's why you should live here. Have you had a situation where, you mentioned the chemical welfare had an issue where some buyers didn't move forward, 
if you had this issue where a buyer didn't move forward because of the deed restriction? We've never had an issue with a buyer not moving forward because of the deed. Now, we do a lot of work with developers who are developing in that neighborhood, and we've had developers ask us whether or not they should go through the effort of removing the, oh, yeah. the piece of, the, um, uh, of the, the, the restrictive language in the deed um, because it might be off-putting to potential buyers who want to buy into the neighborhood. And like Max said, it, it, it's rarely an issue. It's totally unenforceable. No one it's, really right. reads through the it's deed. A, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a non-issue. It's really, it's become a historical footnote. Yeah, it's a piece of history. So, so what do you recommend to your developers in that situation? We, we typically just leave it. It's not worth the cost of redeveloping the deed. You know, it, 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 uh, sorry, re, uh, refiling the deed. So uh, shifting gears, um, do you work with a team right now? So uh, I am a solo practitioner with one assistant. Uh, I have an amazing person, uh, Alicia Keelander, who's been with me for just about two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's a tremendous resource. And my business wouldn't be possible without her. Um, she's been a fantastic find for me. Uh, she offsets all of my neuroses. She's very calm. She's very level-headed. Uh, she's uh, excellent at marketing. Um, and one of the things I love about her is not only is she a go-getter, but um, if there's something she doesn't know how to do, she goes and figures it out. Like you don't have to give her an orientation. You don't, she, just, she just goes and educates herself. And that's a rare thing in this business. Well, that's the difference between someone who's going to be working with you for like a month or two versus a longer time. Yeah, right. so, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. So Does she I, do any showings for you or just back so, in marketing? So she's licensed in all three states, Maryland, Virginia, D.C. She did a showing for me this morning while we're doing this podcast. Uh, she'll do open houses. I mean, she she is involved in every aspect of our business. That's good. And I call it our business because it really, like, uh, she is my assistant, but she's very much a partner. Where did you find her? Um, so that's funny. Uh, I had a former assistant who didn't work out that I got rid of, uh, fairly, um, uh, suddenly and a client friend of mine was telling me that I had to interview this nanny who babysit for her. And she was telling me about this girl that she comes over, she would play with the kids, put them to bed while they were out on a date. And then she would text my friend and say, you know, the kids are asleep. I'm just sitting here. Would you mind if I reorganize your pantry? And my friend would be like, sure, <laughs> go to town. And then the next time she'd come over later in the week and she says, you know, kids are asleep. Would you mind if I organize your closet? And over the course of like a month or two, she totally organized their entire house. And she moved up here from Central Florida, was working for Enterprise Car Rental. And apparently Enterprise has this matriculation program that if you're there, top associate for like a couple of months, Enterprise will make you a branch manager. So she was like working her butt off to try and get this brass ring of a branch manage managership at a random Enterprise car rental. I interviewed her, she was great. So I just said, you know, would you consider a better deal? And that's how she came on board. Well, let me just say, and they're not a sponsor, Enterprise is my go-to car rental company. They do have really good customer service. They, they do. do. They, like the, the, all the associates that are, are usually have this easygoing, like keeping things moving forward, nice attitude. So she ha she has a hospitality degree, had no background in real estate, and she's a hard worker. So you know, for any agents who are really looking for a great assistant who's willing to you know put the work in to teach them the ropes, um, I would say Enterprise is a great place yeah. to coach from. No, that's smart. I was in pharma for a while, and that was always like the stepping stone. If you couldn't get into pharma right out of the gate, you would go to enterprise, do a couple of years there, because the big pharma would just pluck from enterprise on a regular basis. Yeah, I think I think they run a great, I think they have a great program for finding talent and moving them along. I just think in our business we can move them along faster. Um, what's a typical day like for Will Fasto? Well, uh, my boys, I have a five-year-old and eight-year-old, are always up at 5.30 or 6 a.m. every morning. So I, early. I am jolted out of bed by two boys. And no matter how early I go to bed or how early I try and wake up, they're up first. So um, my morning starts with getting them settled, getting them set up, getting them fed, 
um, getting them together for camp or school. While they're eating, I'll sit down at the computer, I'll check my emails, I'll read the news, I'll check on what went on a contract the night before and what's coming onto the market this morning, take them off to school. And then the one positive of this is I'm usually in the office at my desk by 8.30 every morning. And that's fantastic. Um, I love being in the office first thing in the morning and being one of the only people there. I get more done in that first hour, two hours, that I'm there by myself, then I'll get done the rest of the day. And that really kind of sets me up, gives me a chance to sort of block out my time for the day, get all my correspondence out. And then right around nine o'clock, uh, 9.30, I start doing my client outreach, which is reaching out to my clients, calls I need to make, uh, status updates for listings, reaching out to my buyers, and uh, just sort of, you know, working the phones, working my sphere of influence, and uh, you know, seeing who's out there that I, I need to help that day and who we're trying to move into a property, who we're trying to move out of a property, what repairs we need to do and sort of all of those multiple facets that go into running a successful real estate practice. What do your afternoons look like? I know with me, the two little ones, it's like basketball, tennis, uh, sprinkling a little bit of golf and the little girls into like dance and all that jazz. So how do your afternoons work going back and forth? I usually have a hard stop around 5, 30, 6 o'clock, which is right around end of camp, end of school. Uh, pick up my boys, meet them at home, and then I'm with them through dinner, through bedtime, and then sometime around 8 o'clock, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I free up again, and then I'm catching up on all the communications while I was in that blackout period. And I really try hard to be incommunicado for those two to three hours where they come home till they go to bed. And for the most part, I'm successful. I sometimes revert to text only, but I'm not making or receiving calls during that, during that time. Yeah, this is uh, something that's new to my life because uh, I moved in with my girlfriend and her two kids uh, about a year and a half ago. And at first I was kind of just going through the motions of my normal day, just like work whenever I have to work and, you know, just I'm doing my thing. But there's, it's, it's really important that evening time when the kids come home, like that's when you're supposed to be spending time with them and, and they need the attention and that's the time you get to spend with them. That's it. So I've learned to do that too, is stop communicating. And then yes, you have that blackout period and where you're catching up on everything again later. So that's taken some getting used to, but it's just, it's the way, that's the reality. Yeah. Know? I mean, it's tough. You have to be, you have to be present and you have to be there a hundred percent because if you're not um, one, the kids notice you're buried in your phone and you're not really giving your clients your, the best of you and you're not, and your kids aren't getting the best of you. So really you're, you're not, you're not really performing at your best on either of those two fronts. That's so you, well said. Yeah. So you just have to divide the time. Will, thanks for coming on the show today. Um, you've given us some awesome stuff. Fantastic guest, as expected. Thank you. Is Thank there anything else me. you wanted to just add to the conversation here at the end before we get to rapid fire? Um, I mean, thank you so much for having me, guys. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's so much more relaxed. I was really nervous coming in here, and you guys really You're pretty chill. You guys set it at ease. You seemed I, a little tense at first, and then you sort of yeah. Smoothed I mean, it's it's <laughs> tough. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I've been listening for a while, and uh, I was really excited to sort of to get the nod and be asked to come in. So thank you for that. Our pleasure. We're grateful. So rapid five, here we go. You ready? All right. What is your guilty pleasure? Sailing. Sailing. Yeah. Where do you Where sail do you at? Sail? So uh, I own a 40 foot uh, sailboat out of Annapolis on Back Creek. And uh, I've been sailing my entire life. And that's my guilty pleasure. It, it's, we talked earlier about um, needing to disconnect, you know, to be there for the kids. Same thing with sailing. You you unplug your phone, you throw it down in the table down below, and you just totally disconnect. And what's great is you can drive 45 minutes to the water, you can sail an hour or two hours or three hours away, and you can feel like you've gone to another country. It's like a total disconnect for me. When did you start sailing? Um, since the beginning. My parents say I was conceived on a sailboat. Oh, wow. So like, there's always been a sailboat in my life. Did your parents sail? My parents did sail. Okay. I'm only asking because, like I said, before uh, we started recording, 
our little guys in sailing camps. That's right, you said that. Uh, down at Navy Yard, and it's all this week from nine to two, and he goes back in August. I don't sell. I don't ever plan to. So I'm just wondering, like, is he gonna? This is gonna be the aha moment. He becomes a professional. You're gonna sailor. need to buy a sailboat. I mean, that's what I'm. <laughs> he'll I mean, sail, he'll, he'll, the he's gonna. I captain. mean, the great thing about sailboats for kids, and I think it's what what hooks you early, is there are very few sort of vehicular sports that you take a kid, you put them in their own vehicle, and you say, "Okay, kid, go figure it out." And there's no barriers, there's no rules. It either works or it doesn't, and it's a problem. And they just sit there and they figure it out. And when they have that aha moment of like, this is how I trim the sail, and this is how I get going in this direction, and this is how I turn around, it gives kids such an amazing feeling of independence and self-sufficiency, of being self-sufficient, that it, it carries into everything they do. So, I mean, I get it. Like you say sailing, and it sounds super bougie, Especially Bougie. for like a DC real estate podcast, right. but it, it it really is um, it's a fantastic opportunity for kids, and I think they get so much out of it. I'm glad you said that because in my mind, I think like sailing sounds great, right? <laughs> like must be nice, but you're right. I mean, the problem solving aspect of sailing. I mean, I couldn't do it. So right. if you put a young person in there and give them the essentials, and then and it doesn't matter how small the boat is or how big the boat is, like from a from an eight foot boat to a hundred foot yacht the all the uh the skill sets the physics it's all the same truthfully it's just being scaled up so um it's it's a great skill and i think it's actually a really great metaphor for real estate too um and uh i i learn lessons from it every time i go out so that's my guilty pleasure nice. number two i know you're a foodie do you have a go-to restaurant here in dc um Friends and clients of mine own Zeppelin and Shaw, which is a very chill um, uh, Japanese restaurant. Um, a very famous uh, sushi chef, Ogawa, who owns Ogawa over on Connecticut Avenue, which actually is the, uh, um, uh, the de facto catering wing of the Japanese embassy. That's how good he is. Uh, he runs their sushi program there. Um, so that's an easy go-to for me. Yeah, he's le it's legit. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. You mentioned a movie night earlier. Do you have a favorite movie that you like? Favorite movie? Um, this is going to be going back there. My favorite movie, it, excuse me, movie is um, Being There with Peter Sellers. I don't know if you've ever seen it. This is such an old movie. I've not seen that. It's, it, you, have to, it, you have to watch it. It's a great movie. It's something to do while our kids are away because I, that's not like they, they were watching. No, but it's it's a um, it's one of those movies that it was a parody when it was written and filmed, and now it's more real than it was when they filmed it. Being there, if I can get outside of the uh, Maverick zone. Yeah, Maverick was, good. Maverick was good, He's though. He's seen good. Top Gun Maverick a hundred times now, yes. right? Really? That many? I'm trying to get Tom Cruise <laughs> to like 1.5 billion in gross I, sales. I saw it at Udvar Hazi at the IMAX. Um, That's at, cool. At the Air and Space Museum. And it, I mean, it, it's a solid movie. That's good. Yeah. I think it's, you know, personally, I think it's better than the first. But I, to me, it's like number one, number two up there right next to Godfather. I definitely left that movie <laughs> on, a, on a high <laughs> Like I, I, I was like so into it and I got halfway home from Udbar Hazi, which is like a half hour drive back to DC. Yeah. So about 15 minutes into my drive, I was like, wait a second, that mission was so implausible. It was so ridiculous. Oh uh, yeah. But I, I didn't even care. Like right. it, was, it was great. I know you like to travel. Do you have a, a go-to travel spot you like to frequent? It's tough because of COVID. Like I don't think any of us have been traveling as much as we like and I'm usually going to a new place. So there's very few places I've been back to multiple times. The one exception I'll say is I love doing the San Francisco to Napa trip. Like I love flying into SFO, spending a night or two in San Francisco, um, driving out to Napa, spending a couple days in wine country, coming back, flying home. So I'd say that that's, we've done that three or four times over the last uh, half decade. So that's a nice one. Last question here. We're in the middle of the summer. The market's been hot for the last two years. Any predictions for the rest of 2022? That's a much more difficult question to answer. There's a rapid today. question. 
It is a rabbit question. No, it's. Oh. The, I mean, I'm saying like it, it, this. The way that things have been going, it maybe like earlier this year, it's like, what do you think of the? Yeah, it'll it'll be okay. Up, up, it's up, gonna up, be up, yeah, right. yeah. Right. No, I I think we're at a tipping point. Like, um, I take a very holistic, cerebral view of the market. Um, we had a double holiday with Father's Day and Juneteenth, a uh, 75 basis point rate increase and the worst financial forecast in the last 14 years all happened in the space of five business days. And um, that really pumped the brakes on this market. And I think that buyers are recovering from the whiplash of that. And I've seen a lot more hesitancy. We've seen uh, buyers pulling back from the market sort of taking a breather and just kind of seeing where the economy goes before making a decision. You know, we were at what, 3% 30 year fixed interest rates six months ago. Now we're approaching 6%. I think it's come down a little bit. We're around five and a half right now. But for people like, uh, uh, like you guys who've been in the business since 2006, 2007, I mean, 5% in 2007 was like deemed like the lowest interest rates have ever been. So I think that we are at a moment where we lack perspective because we've been such a crazy market for the last two or three years and money has been so cheap and people are going to come around and realize 5% is, yes, significantly more than 3%, but it's still historically very low. Um, we still don't know have enough housing inventory, at least single family inventory to meet demand, and we still have people who are going to need to move. So I think that this market will come back. I think it will be strong, uh, but I think it's going to be uh, a shift back to a, a more stable uh, market than we've seen the last two or three years, which have just been totally frenzied nonsense. Yeah, That's great I, 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 yeah, and I think that once we all adjust, we're all going to be happier and healthier. But it's going to be an adjustment. I mean, if I have a listing now and it doesn't go under contract in three days, I think I'm an abject failure. <laughs> like that's that's not a healthy. Your sellers definitely right. do. Right. That's that's like not a happened. healthy place to be, and that's not a normal market. Totally. So, uh, I mean, uh, typical list times used to be like 30, 45, 60 days. That seems like an eternity now. So it's really just about having that mental shift, and and sort of realigning our expectations and realigning our clients' expectations. Awesome. Will Fastow, thank you so much for coming on today. You shared some fantastic stuff, as expected. Um, we always uh, donate to a charity of our guest choice. Who would you like to give a shout out to? Uh, I've been involved with a charity here in DC for many years called Bite Back, uh, B-Y-T-E, Back. Uh, they provide free technology training to DC residents. So uh, they go to people who don't have technolo technology skills, teach them computer skills, programming skills to move them into uh, uh, more robust, higher paying employment. And I think that they're one of the best local charities here in DC. So thank you guys, that's very generous. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to Keyed In with your hosts, Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. For more information on selling your home, find us online at keyedinpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Keyed In on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Keyed In Podcast, at Raven Max, and at Brent E. Jackson. And follow Max on TikTok at Maxwell Rabin underscore properties. Oh, oh, oh.